All right. As folks continue to find their way into the event, I'm going to kick us off. Uh, thanks to everybody for being here. My name is Liberty, and I'm a member of the Firestorm Collective. Uh, we're excited tonight to be hosting uh, feminist historian Angela Hume um, in conversation with uh, co-founder and executive director of Shout Your Abortion, Amelia Bono. Angela's new book, uh, Deep Care, The Radical Activists Who Provided Abortions, Defied the Law, and Fought to Keep Clinics Open, is the story of Women's Choice Clinic in Oakland uh, in the early 1970s to 2010, and it examines the transformative relationship between the independent clinic itself, uh, underground abortion providers, and clinic defense activists. So Firestorm is an almost 16-year-old radical bookstore owned and operated by a queer feminist collective um, in Southern Appalachia on the land of the Cherokee people. Uh, we strive to feature books and events that reflect our interests and the needs of marginalized communities in the South. And we are continuing to do uh, events online um, in addition to doing events in person, uh, both because we like to be able to connect with authors and audience at a distance, and also because we know that it enhances the accessibility of the content that we can post. So thanks so much for being here. And if you're interested in keeping up with our future events, you can follow us on social media or sign up for our newsletter, which I'll put a link to in the chat in a couple minutes. So tonight, please note that we are using a Zoom webinar, which has some pros and cons. Uh, in terms of audience participation, which we, we hope you will, uh, there is a Q&A tool, which you can find at the bottom of your screen. Um, and I hope that you will uh, access that uh, at any point during the event when you have uh, a question. Um, we will be doing kind of Q&A at the end, but it's always nice to have a little bit of a queue lined up. So please, uh, you know, as you're hearing from uh, Angela, definitely write those questions out. Okay, so getting started tonight. Uh, Angela Hume is a feminist historian, critic, and poet. Uh, she's the author of two poetry books, Interventions for Women and Middle Time, and co-editor of the book, Eco Poetics, Essays in the Field. She teaches writing at the University of California, Berkeley. Amelia Bono is the co-founder and executive director of Shout Your Abortion, a nationwide organization working to normalize abortion and elevate paths to access regardless of legality. She's the co-editor of Shout Your Abortion's eponymous title, eponymously titled book, um, which sits in the waiting rooms of hundreds of abortion clinics. Uh, and she reminded me uh, as we were getting ready for this event that uh, during the uh, book tour several years ago, uh, uh, her event <laughs> resulted in protesters outside of Firestorm, which was actually the first and only time we've ever had people stand directly in front of our space with signs. Uh, so kind of a, a, a funny memory. Um, and uh, I think speaks to the intensity of the politics uh, that we're talking about tonight. Uh, Amelia uh, proudly serves as co-chair of the Board of Directors of Abortion Care Network, a uh, national organization which represents and serves independent abortion providers. Uh, so happy to have both of y'all here tonight. I know we're going to have a great conversation, and I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to you, Angela. Thanks so much, Liberty, and thank you to Firestorm Books for hosting us tonight. It's really generous of you all to just make and hold this space for us, so thank you. And Amelia, it's a total honor and privilege to be here in conversation with you. Um, thank you so much for taking a look at my book and coming out to have a conversation about it. And thank you to everyone who's here in the room tonight. I can't, we can't actually see um, who's here because uh, it's a webinar, not like a Zoom meeting, but um, I really appreciate you being here for the event. So thank you. Um, so I'm going to read from my book, um, Deep Care, The Radical Activists Who Provided Abortions, Defied the Law, and Fought to Keep Clinics Open for a few minutes, just to um, kind of give you a sense of what the book is about. And um, I'm going to read like a little bit of introductory material, again, just to kind of like 
give you a sense of the scope. And then um, I want to read a few moments in the book um, when abortion defenders who I interviewed talked about like the motivating forces of anger and frustration and um, ferocity and outrage and rage. And um, one of the reasons I want to do that is because Shout Your Abortion, Amelia's project and organization, um, is in this moment committed to, quote, pushing activist outrage into public consciousness like never before. That's some language from their mission statement page. And so I thought it could be really interesting and generative to kind of center outrage um, and the political power of outrage um, in, in some of our conversation tonight. So I'll give you a glimpse into outrage in the selections that I read. This is from the preface. This is a story about revolutionary deep care, community care that transforms and empowers us from the inside out through practice and over time. It's the story of an independent abortion clinic an abortion underground or secretive network, and a clinic defense coalition that were active during some of the years that abortion was legal in all 50 United States. The clinic practiced feminist sexual, reproductive, and abortion health care and taught people about body sovereignty or how to have power in your body and in your life. The underground self-help movement took from the clinic supplies and knowledge about how to provide abortions and seeded them throughout the community. The Clinic Defense Coalition fought to keep the clinic open and defend the community against anti-abortion extremists. I think of them, the clinic, the underground, and the coalition as a single radical abortion defense movement history, and the lessons this history has to offer couldn't be more urgent today. Next, I'll just read a few paragraphs from the introduction. This section is called Learn, Defy, Fight. Deep Care braids three story threads. A first thread is about the Oakland Feminist Women's Health Center and Women's Choice Clinic, for many years part of a network called the Federation of Feminist Women's Health Centers and later renamed the West Coast Feminist Health Project and Women's Choice Clinic. This thread chronicles moments in the clinic's near 40 year struggle to keep its doors open and provide feminist abortion and sexual health care. In this thread, I track and theorize the influences of gay women's liberation, the Black Panther Party, and a longer tradition of Black women's health activism and self-help health care on clinic politics and philosophies of abortion counseling and abortion work. I tell stories about how this specific clinic transformed how people imagined reproductive health care, how, for example, it started the first sperm bank in the country to serve single women and lesbians, as well as the first to offer a donor identity release option, and how the clinic played a critical role in helping to get the abortion pill Mifepristone approved in the United States. Throughout this first thread, I explore the participatory clinic model of small group care that distinguished women's choice from mainstream providers. The participatory clinic posited that sexual health care must be a non-hierarchical shared undertaking. A second story thread historicizes the underground gynecological and abortion self-help movement in California's Bay Area. The simple fact that abortion has been practiced intentionally, carefully, holistically, and near constantly by skilled but unlicensed lay people outside of the medical institution, even during years that Roche stood, has not been adequately grasped or theorized. In this thread, I offer stories and analysis of this movement. Drawing on interviews with underground self-helpers, I show how these activists took abortion care into their own hands, learning, practicing, and teaching manual suction abortion beyond the walls of the clinic. The work abortion self-helpers did both inside and outside of clinics was complementary and revolutionary. Underground self-help groups in the Bay Area relied on health workers at Women's Choice for access to medical knowledge and supplies. Critically, this thread reveals how these activists, along with health workers at a licensed clinic, together transferred restricted knowledge about gynecology and abortion to lay people. 
A third story thread chronicles Bay Area abortion defenders' central role in resisting the rise of the Christian right's militant anti-abortion campaigns. In the 1980s and 1990s, the Bay Area Coalition for Reproductive Rights, or BAYCOR, which included Women's Choice, along with the feminist group Radical Women, the feminist collective Women Against Imperialism, the anti-imperialist group Roots Against War, a loose-knit group of queer anti-fascists, labor organizers and trade unionists, and others, executed a creative, tactically sophisticated, and highly effective clinic defense movement with na nationwide reach. Bay Area abortion defenders also trained and led volunteers in clinic escorting over many decades. In the end, I offer some final stories and reflections that respond to a question. What survival lessons do gynecological and abortion self-help and clinic events offer us today when reproductive justice and body sovereignty are less a legal reality in the United States than they were a half century ago? As I show, self-helpers and clinic defenders made a world in which intimate knowing of self and community was both possible and revolutionary. They did so by learning to provide abortions themselves, defying the law when necessary, and fighting to keep clinics open. As a longtime Women's Choice Clinic director, Lindsay Comey, put it to me, we did it before and we'll do it again. And now I'll just read, um, again, a few short sections um, on the topic of outrage. Um, this first section is from about midway through the book, um, a chapter focused on the Bay Area Coalition for our Reproductive Rights, the clinic defense uh, grassroots coalition that started in the San Francisco Bay Area. And um, Baycor brought a lot of street theater to their offensive actions, right? Street demonstrations, um, outreach. And in 1989, Baycor staged a fairly ostentatious mock wedding outside of San Francisco's first Orthodox Presbyterian church. And during this mock wedding, a minister pronounced a couple man and property while like a just sort of slew of rowdy guests shouted at them, breed, 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 and pelted the bride with um, coat hangers uh, strung with plastic babies. So I sort of elaborate this scene in more detail in the book as it was narrated to me. Um, and the next little section that I'll read is just some sort of commentary on it. In 1989, Baycor was made up of lots of lesbians and queer folks, inspired in part by the performative tactics of ACT UP or AIDS Coalition to Unlock Power. Baycor embraced visuals and words that confronted and exposed the hypocrisy of their enemies. When they were on the offense, demonstrating at Christian churches or in the streets, they used humor, camp, and satire. What struck me most about Baycor's mock wedding was that it did not hold back in its representation of violence directed at the bride. We were unruly, uh, the longtime Baycor member Laura Whitey said in the scene to me. It was too much, and in the too much lies the exposure. This is how the satire packed its punch, the moment when the mock wedding, which was bold and bawdy, escalated into something like a mock rape outside of a church. When the satire becomes contemptuous, devastating, and total, that was the moment of truth. It's difficult to go to these types of places and tell the truth that the Christian right did and does subject women to violence by forcing marriage, heterosexual, procreative sex, pregnancy, birth, and parenthood on them and that this violence can be emotional, physical, sexual, or all three. In a discussion of the scene, a clinic defender in Baycor named Agnes, that's a pseudonym, pointed out that the wedding captures what it might feel like to be a woman who becomes pregnant and doesn't want to be, as if the whole world is pelting you with dangerous objects, including men and babies. It felt great, Agnes said, of pulling off the scene. There we were in front of the church, the center of the oppression, and we were able to just make total vicious fun of them and their whole woman-hating thing. It felt good to say what it was really all about, which was women being stomped into the dirt. As Agnes's comments suggest, the scene registers how personal the movement was for clinic defenders. Baycor had a political analysis, and they also had lived experience. They were women who had had unplanned pregnancies themselves and who had experienced discrimination and policing by the medical institution, churches, and the state. They were lesbians, gays, queers, and gender nonconforming people who had been the target of homophobic and transphobic speech and violence. 
Their street theater reflected the emotional pain, exasperation, and outrage they harbored toward institutions that seemed hell-bent on pacifying, controlling, immiserating, and erasing them. As they wrote around the time of the mock wedding, the attack on reproductive rights is also an attack on sexual freedom, particularly for women, youth, and lesbians and gay men. The only political statement I've ever heard that has more layers to it than the personal is, pol is political, Bay Corps member Cass McMahon said to me, is silence equals death. That's the message central to Act Up campaign, Act Up's campaign. Bay Corps members were not afraid to allow their politics to be informed by their deepest, rawest wounds, and they were unwilling to stay silent. The wedding was satirical improv street theater, but when you start to think about what women and queer and trans people were up against, especially with the Webster versus Reproductive Health Services decision coming down at the same time and marking the beginning of the end of Roe, the ironry starts to crumble. Baycor did its work at the edge of this sinkhole. Okay, this next section is from chapter eight, also about clinic defense. A group of a dozen comrades, new and old, convened in San Francisco's Mission District, and Raven, that's a pseudonym, leaned in close. They crowded around a row of tables they'd formed, surrounded by posters and framed photographs of their heroes and sheroes on the walls of Cafe Macondo. In her late 20s, Raven had been exposed to left organizations in the past, but she wasn't in one. The group had convened to imagine a new formation that would center their anti-imperialist politics and direct action orientation. They were internationalists who saw wars abroad and at home as inextricably linked. Their question at the cafe that day was what to call themselves. Days before, the group had attended a talk by Tahan K. Jones, a young black man from Oakland. Tahan was a Marine reservist who had filed for conscientious objector status. And then in fall 1990, when he refused to report for duty, was charged by the state with desertion. He spoke passionately about the racism of the state, its use of young, mostly poor people and people of color to fight its wars, and expressed his frustration over racism in the anti-war movement. Despite serious charges, Tahan's case wasn't high profile like some other white conscientious, conscientious objectors' cases were, and it was difficult for him to relate to the white and middle-class character of the anti-war movement. Raven recalled, Tahan spoke for all of us that day, and that led us to Cafe Macondo. After brainstorming all the obvious words to describe who and what they were, the group landed on the word roots, along with the phrase against war, raw for short. As they talked, one comrade named Spee drew intently, then slid a napkin into the center of the table. Raw appeared in bold graffiti style. Actually, I'd love to share an image with you if I can do a screen share. Liberty, is that? do you think that might be possible? Yeah, for sure. I might need to make you a co-host okay. real fast. Um, okay. Uh, give it a shot and see if you can initiate a screen share at the bottom of your screen there. Looks like not yet. Okay. Uh, give it another try now. That worked. Okay. Raw appeared in bold graffiti style, springing up from a tract of earth where bodies labored and rose in rows and fields, suggesting the stripes of the American flag. The word raw was breaking through the chain links and barbed wire that ran across the horizon line, and a map of the Middle East spread down and into the foreground. In the distance, hovering across the top of the graphic, was a silhouette of raised fists and hands, gripping guns and other tools, symbols of liberation struggles worldwide. Soon after, Raven told me, Ra would add clinic defense to its repertoire of resistance actions, and they would play a significant role whenever they showed up. Ra joined Baycor. They were a member of the coalition. Ra could say things about the intersection of race, gender, and class, and show up in a way that no one else was really was at the time, Raven said. In 1992, Ra wrote, quote, as young, angry, conscious people of color, Roots Against War carries on a proud history of resistance against imperialism, invoking earlier militant movements of the 1960s, like the Black Panthers, Young Lords, and American Indian Movement at home, while also linking themselves to contemporary struggles in places like South Africa and Palestine. Raw linked anti-imperialist struggles to prison abolition and fights against anti-Arab policies and xenophobia. 
And because women's liberation and leadership were central to their analysis and vision, they also made connections between war and reproductive rights. Quote, the courts are taking away women's rights to an abortion, yet they encourage women to join the military to kill for them. 50% of women in the army are black, end quote. They analyzed patriarchy, underscoring how it punished women of color by criminalizing them for seeking abortions and by denying them social benefits. Raven said, we brought a boombox and banners and a table full of sharp and irreverent materials like a sticker with George H. Bush getting his head kicked off by a high top basketball shoe. Our soundtrack was Paris's Break the Grip of Shame, Public Enemies Fight the Power, The Coup by The Coup. We had impromptu speak outs with the, ribbon of, with the rhythm of congas. We knew our audience because it was us. If you experienced our outreach, you knew our events would be raw and unapologetic. It would not be a bunch of old white folks on a permitted Saturday stroll singing, give peace a chance, ringed by people in orange vests. In the months that followed, raw grew exponentially. In their literature, signs, and chants, they named the ways the war on women was bigger than the attacks on abortion access. It was also about fascism, homophobia, and normalizing sexual violence, and exploiting women's unpaid reproductive labor amid welfare cutbacks. In characteristic raw style, their March 8th International Women's Day event was called Yo Mama Wears Combat Boots, and participants literally and figuratively took a sledgehammer to TVs and scales and burned fashion magazines and other symbols of women's oppression. Quote, these issues are about control of our lives and we've got to fight back women and men together, they wrote. Okay, uh, maybe one more section. This is from chapter nine and it's titled, Rage is Your Bitter Fuel. And this, tra this chapter is centered on events that happened during the 1990s. If you were in an underground self-help group, you understood that under no circumstances were you to talk to the police. But during the Clinton years, law enforcement and FBI agents were closer to women's choice than ever before. Lindsay Comey, the longtime director of Women's Choice, had to get dispensation from her fellow self-helpers because the reality was that she was about to start talking to the police whether she liked it or not. She told me the story as we sat in the sand at Ocean Beach wrapped in blankets. We'd chosen a spot at the base of a dune so that we would have some protection from the whipping wind. Sea and sky were a similar winter ash gray. It was January 2021, a few days after a mob of more than 2,000 Donald Trump supporters had violently invaded the U.S. Capitol. It's bitter fuel, what Lindsay told me, rage. And when you're living under occupation, it's the only fuel you've got. Lindsay emphasized to me that in the 1990s, abortion clinics were under siege. She remembered the hate mail, the liability insurance premium hikes. She remembered being out on the job and asking herself if today was the day she was going to have to climb out on the fire ladder or wondering while she was driving around if she should be wearing a bulletproof vest. Starting in 1993, a high profile doctor named Bruce Steer who worked some shifts at Women's Choice was accompanied by federal marshals to and from the Reading Feminist Women's Health Center where he provided abortions once a week. Bruce was well known among both abortion activists and anti-abortion act or antis because he was someone who traveled to multiple clinics around the state and was able to perform later procedures. He played a critical role in making later abortion care available in California. He was assigned federal protection when he received a threatening letter at the Reading Clinic from an anti-abortion extremist named Ron Walters. It read, Dear Dr. Bruce, Goodbye, testify that he has cursed both God and the king, then take him out and stone him to death. Lindsay told me that U.S. Marshals accompanied Bruce when he worked at Women's Choice, too. How did the other health workers feel about having the federal officers inside of the clinic, I asked her. Did they feel that you needed to accept the support because you were at war? I think we had mixed feelings, Lindsay said. One of the things we did to deal with that was to set the guy up in the hall so that he wasn't in anyone's personal space. She continued, it was something that was put on us. The escort was for the doctor. I was glad that they had officers picking them up and taking them to clinics, though. She was glad about it, Lindsay explained, because doctors were being shot at coming and going from work and their cars were getting bombed. One doctor at Women's Choice got himself a handheld mirror, which he used to check under his car to make sure nobody had cut his brakes or planted an explosive. In 1994, clinic health workers started wearing bulletproof vests to work. 
After the federal task force was established in 1998, Lindsay was asked to participate in a local working group that included staff from other clinics, the FBI and local police and their intelligence department representatives. She told me that being in the working group was just something that she had to do, in her words, to help deal with weapons of mass destruction, gunmen firing bombs and chemical weapons. The 1998 murder of Barnett Slapian, a Buffalo abortion provider, um, along with news of a website that listed the names of abortion doctors, compelled Women's Choice to ratchet up their security game. In early 1999, Women's Choice put out a call for donations to help cover the cost of bulletproof vests for escorts. Because of frequent protests, the clinic had stopped offering abortion clinics on the weekends. Lindsay told me about some of the ways she and other abortion workers were forced to change their lifestyles during the war years. You had a different code about how you were supposed to live as an abortion provider. You weren't supposed to always drive the same way to the clinic. You were supposed to check and see if there was a problem before you parked your car. You were not supposed to have your windows or curtains open. You were supposed to live in a state of seclusion under a state of occupation. The war was at your door. She added, just trying to deal with that stuff on a day-to-day -day level really took its toll. A lot of people couldn't handle it and left. It was really, really hard. For those who walked away, they were walking away from something really intense. And I think it's always okay to say, I have to leave the war. She continued, one of the things we tried to do was declare that the clinic was revolutionary space and that when you walked in the door, you left the bullshit drama behind. We did the best we could with what we had to make the space as safe as we could. Every health worker gave their time and undivided attention to the women and their needs. We did it with the idea that women could teach each other and reach each other and make decisions. All they needed was for someone to tell them what the truth was. That fueled our lives. But the burnout of doing reproductive care work was atrocious. The hatred took its toll. Okay, thanks for um, staying with me for that reading. And I'll stop there. I'm also going to um, end the screen share. If it hasn't ended already, it looks like it has. It has ended. Hi, Angela. Hi, Amelia. Hi, everybody else. Um, thank you, Firestorm, for having us. Thank you all for being here later in the day, in the end of February, which is like the longest, darkest month, at least where I live, which is Seattle, Washington. Um, I'm really honored to be speaking with you this evening, Angela, about your beautiful book. Um, it is so... Uh, it, it, it feels like really good news um, in a time where that kind of thing is hard to come by. And um, it feels like good news that I'm excited to share um, with the folks that SYA talks to all over the country about how we can not only survive in post-Dobbs America, but um, how, how can we build something that might just be better than the thing that was promised to us and never delivered, which is a just and equitable healthcare system, um, you know, absent of horrific medical racism and atrocious rates of maternal mortality, um, you know, all of these things that uh, I think we are trained to see as normal and better and the thing that we should be trying to cling to, um, your book proposes that there is a different world, that we have what it takes to build um, for ourselves and each other, and that we should do that regardless of what is happening politically. Um, and that is happening. This, this world is being built. Um, so I have a lot of questions for you, obviously. Um, I do want to just say um, it feels like I can't listen to, um, I can't, I can't root a conversation in outrage without acknowledging the atrocity that is unfolding in Palestine um, for you know months and months and months now and decades and decades and decades. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, Aaron Bushnell the active member of the US Air Force who self-immolated in an act of protest in front of the United States, the Israeli embassy in Washington DC on Sunday, um, which is uh, 
just about as powerful of an act of expressing one's outrage as I can think of. Um, yeah. So I want to, there are so many things that I love about your book. One thing that I love is that it's a super queer book and um, it's, it's pretty silly to me. So it's, it's a queer book and it's also like a sex book. It's a book that contains a lot of sex and sexuality and queerness. All of these things are uh, conspicuously absent from most conversations about abortion in this country. Um, what an oversight. Um, and, you know, this book is, is a, in part an oral history. And a lot of the folks that comprise the storytellers in this book are queer folks. You are a queer person. Um, and the movement that you really focus on is explicitly a, a West Coast queer movement. Um, and like, you know, the repro movement has been slow to come around to, uh, to trans inclusion, not just in terms of language, but in terms of like, um, recognizing that these struggles are completely not even connected, but like in many ways the same. Um, and mm -hmm. that like the enemy is the same. The enemy has like the objective of the enemy in in um, trying to suppress trans people's ability to live free in their body and build families and you know identify and access medical care all of these things it's like the same reason why they want to fuck with abortion right um and so i guess i wanted to talk to you about like the interconnection of these movements and and as you say how like both queer movements and radical abortion movements, or in the case of your book, like one and the same, that these communities are fighting for the kind of empowerment that comes from self-reliance, which I really love. So I wondered if you could just talk about abortion and queerness and that as an orientation for this work. Yeah. Oh, thank you for all of your words. That was so eloquent and you just said so much. So thank you for it. And yes, yes to everything that you've said. Um, that's a great question. It's a great, it's a great place to start. Radical abortion defense, gynecological and abortion self-help and clinic defense in the San Francisco Bay area were queer led movements from the start, right? Like some of the first activists who became involved in gynecological and abortion self-help were lesbian identified women who, um, you know, were building abortion clinics in part as a way to create a safe space where they could work and be out together. Right. Um, and then as I get into in the book, like over the course of the 1980s and into the 1990s, um, amid queer liberation and trans liberation, um, activists were doing clinic defense just as they were organizing with ACT UP um, to fight HIV AIDS and with Queer Nation um, to ad advocate for queer liberation. So so absolutely, um, the kind of particular case of the Bay Area is super queer history. Um, but like, as you were saying, you know, more generally reproductive rights and reproductive justice struggles and queer and trans health justice struggles are so structurally similar and so interconnected, right? And that both are resounding no's to policing, to the body cops. Um, they're sibling movements, if not the same movement, right? I mean, I think, you know, that it's important to sort of uh, look at the ways in which they have been distinctive, but there are, there are lots of ways in which these movements have just been so close. Um, poor women and queer and trans people have always had to fight for access to non-traumatic health care. Um, most of the abortion defenders who I interviewed for deep care had had unplanned pregnancies themselves. So in some ways, the book, it's like, it's just, you know, it's many, many people courageously shouting their abortion stories, right? Like these were abortion activists who um, also had lived, they had lived the experience of accessing abortion for themselves, right? So um, most had had unplanned pregnancies, most had had abortions, some had, um, you know, become parents at a time in their lives when they weren't expecting to become parents. Um, and 
you know, most had also experienced discrimination and policing of different sorts associated with their abortion or parenthood choice. Um, and these same people, right, um, who had had abortions were very often also lesbians, queers, or gender nonconforming people who had also been the target of hateful speech and violence um, for those aspects of their identity. Um, and so it was just, it was all so close, right? They were just experiencing all of these different forms of discrimination and oppression, and they were on the front lines of that struggle um, to resist the rise of the new right in the 1980s and then um, beyond into the 1990s. Um, that organization, the Clinic Defense Coalition that I mentioned, Bay Area Coalition for Reproductive Rights, wrote in 1989, the attack on reproductive rights is also an attack on sexual freedom, particularly for women and youth and lesbians and gay men. I think I quoted from that earlier. Um, and so they saw those connections, right, between reproductive freedom, sexual freedom, the freedom to love who you want to love. Um, and you know, which is just to say that they understood, again, that reproductive freedom was inextricable from struggles against homophobia and queerphobia and transphobia. Um, and not to mention in the 1980s, the right wing weaponization of HIV AIDS. Um, and so I would, I mean, I think I would say, one thing I would say is that reproductive justice activists have always also been queer and trans health justice activists because cis women and queer and trans people of all genders share that lived experience of surviving the violence of feminization. That is to say, like the rights of objectification and sexual exploitation and degradation of them. Um, and I think, you know, at the most fundamental level, reproductive justice and queer and trans liberation are um, struggles for improved material conditions for women and gender minorities, right? In particular, women of color. And their struggles to get basic needs met, like access to healthcare and safe spaces and freedom to just move and speak and live. Um, and I think like one thing that strikes me is that this is really kind of what feminism to me is all about, like helping people meet material needs, each other's and their own, you know? So I, I love that um, in the end, we can sort of, uh, by looking at the connectedness of um, reproductive justice and queer and trans health justice struggles, we can sort of come back around to a possible definition for feminism that's, um, you know, kind of fresh in some ways. So I don't know, I'll stop there. I could say more, but I hope that was helpful in terms of just like drawing out some of the interconnectedness of, of those movements. Yes, that was so helpful. And um, I love how much I love that your book like references ACT UP and the crossover there. I'm like a super fan of um, ACT UP. And I also just love the way that your book highlights lesbians as just like the MVPs of public health crisis moments that like maybe don't directly affect them. And I'm using air quotes because like these things affect everyone. But um you know, like the AIDS crisis was not predominantly affecting lesbians and unplanned pregnancies don't predominantly affect lesbians. So I have like a majorly special place in my heart for um, lesbians being incredible caretakers in moments of crisis, whether we're looking at like uh, abortion being denied to people or um, AIDS healthcare being denied to people. Um, and I love the way that how much your book focuses on lesbians. So um, I also- I, I uh, love lesbians as the MVPs of public health activism. <laughs> defense. That's really yeah. well sad. And it, it's actually, it's it's just true, you know? Yeah, totally, yeah. totally. Yeah. Um, so there's, uh, your book talks a lot about menstrual extraction and um, SYA talks a ton about abortion pills. We have talked less about menstrual extraction um, and that was one of the many reasons why your book was so exciting to me. Um, I wonder if you can sort of just like, just tell the folks, what is a menstrual extraction? Um, how did it come to be used? Um, or like, I think that talking about the development of the DELAM would be really interesting. Um, but like how, how menstrual extraction was used in the collective that you focus on. And also just like how understanding the technique of menstrual extraction expanded your own perception of what is medical care that is provided by doctors versus what is like 
a home remedy and thing that we can do for our own bodies and one another, but others' bodies outside of a medical context. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So yeah, thank you. Um, so yes, menstrual extraction is a process and a practice that's very much kind of at the center of the book. Um, menstrual extraction is essentially a procedure for manual vacuum aspiration, um, starting in the very early 1970s and, you know, continuing for decades, um, in what were called self-help groups, um, activists, um, taught and practiced just routine gynecological care and at-home suction abortions. Um, and they studied things like how to recognize possible STIs, how to track their cycles, their fertility, how to do pelvic exams and size the uterus. Um, so they were really learning about gynecology in a small group context. Um, and they were also learning how to perform early abortions using a very simple suction device that they invented and put together themselves. Um, in the Bay Area, self-helpers got resources and supplies through community clinics, um, especially Women's Choice, and they became proficient in performing early manual suction abortions for each other and for people in their community. Um, and this practice was not only happening in the San Francisco Bay Area, but um, you know, the act sort of activism and activities in the Bay Area are the sort of focus of my book. Um, so menstrual extraction is what self-helpers call that manual section procedure and process. Um, the process meant that everyone was trained in all of the roles and the self-help group would center the experience and autonomy of the person receiving the procedure. Um, the device was very simple. It uh, involved a syringe to create suction, a one-way valve um, to prevent air from going the reverse direction and potentially back into the uterus, which can be deadly. Um, it required tubing, a mason jar, and a flexible plastic cannula, which is kind of like a straw. Um, and that device that early self-helpers developed and built out of items that mostly could be found like in their homes or at hardware stores, at aquarium stores, um, inspired, helped inspire what is called the IPASS MVA or plastic manual vacuum aspirator, which is a piece of medical equipment that is now used all around the world um, in places where clinic infrastructure does not exist. Um, and in fact, there has been a lot of advocacy more recently in the United States context to push for more training for primary uh, care physicians to learn MVA so that that procedure could potentially be offered in a non-abortion clinic setting. Um, so I write about in the book how for early self-helpers and for some later self-helpers too, um, like an abortion resulting from a mental menstrual extraction was not so much like the aim, but like a corollary to like this radical action that you could take to assert your right to bleed. Um, and that's true, right? Like there was this kind of emphasis on that um, kind of gray area around, you know, what was actually happening. Are you, are you performing a menstrual extraction to simply remove your period, which is what some self-helpers said they were doing, or are you, are you doing it to remove a possible pregnancy? Um, but practically through the decades, um, self-helpers were not indifferent, um, to the possibility of pregnancy, um, like determining whether someone could be or was pregnant, like affected how the group would, um, you know, measure risks, assess risks and like go forward with a procedure. So um, they actually really studied um, how, how to uh, know whether someone could be pregnant based on, you know, just um, what they were seeing with their eyes and feeling with their hands. Um, so, um, you know, like philosophically what self-helpers were doing was rejecting like a pregnant, non-pregnant binary, which they felt was a patriarchal way of thinking about the body. So decentering pregnancy was a way of saying like, it's my right to bleed, right? Uh, it doesn't matter if I'm pregnant, I, it's my right to bleed. Um, so, you know, they really wanted to reimagine the body and the female cycle, like on their own terms. Um, I think I'm trying to think what I want to say next. So 
Um, you know, for me, like I remember when I first started really learning about menstrual extraction and talking with people who had participated in self-help groups, whether back in the 1970s or in the 1980s or the 90s or beyond, and just sort of becoming um, so absorbed by this philosophy, right? And by this this sort of idea of a group practice that was like, you know, so democratizing and that just, you know, everyone sort of learned all of the roles and everyone was a participant, um, you know, especially the recipient of the procedure. And there are all sorts of ways in which it just um, kind of blew my mind, you know? And it was interesting just like interviewing people and how so many self-helpers describe that kind of aha moment, you know, when they first started learning and practicing menstrual extraction and how it changed their minds, right? And I think um, there's so much to say about like what is profound about menstrual extraction. Um, I think one thing that I thought a lot about in my research and in my learning was just like how um, the process and the procedure um, kind of troubles that assumed distinction that we have about like um, the threshold between the inside and the outside of the body, you know, and this idea that only a doctor or only a surgeon can sort of transgress that boundary and go inside of the body, right? Um, you know, like uh, some of the earliest self-helpers in the 1970s who were originally developing this procedure and process, you know, were so um, kind of astonished to really look at how accessible the cervix is, right? Um and, you know, like in the book, I write a lot about um, in self-help groups, how self-helpers would practice self-exam. It was called vaginal self-exam and cervical self-exam, right? Where they would insert a speculum into their vagina and view their cervix and, you know, um, learn about like fertility and where they might be in their cycle and that sort of thing. And, um, you know, just like that kind of basic moment of realization, right? That like your uterus is not this wildly inaccessible part of your body. It's rather, it's, it's right there, you know? And I think, um, you know, as, as someone who's interested in philosophy, um, I, I just, I found that to be such a profound place to go, right? Like that kind of, um, somewhat arbitrary distinction that we sometimes make between the inside of the outside and like who gets to go inside versus who does not, you know, um, and how abortion self-helpers really challenged that, you know? And that was really powerful for so many different reasons. Um, you know, I think um, you mentioned abortion pills and like um, that one thing that I just wanted to say is that, you know, like menstrual extraction and manual vacuum aspiration are not like of the past, right? They're not obsolete. Like abortion pills are an amazing life-saving option and um, they're widely available today, right? Like you can learn about how to access abortion pills from any U.S. state at plancpills.org, right? And um, at this point, um, even if you live in a state uh, with a ban, um, you can still obtain abortion pills by mail from a provider in the United States now, um, which is which is huge. It's such a game changer. Um, so visit plancypills.org if, if you haven't yet familiarized yourself with this essential resource. Um, but the wide availability of a, the wide availability of abortion pills is not in itself like sufficient abortion infrastructure in this country. Um, there are many reasons why someone might require or choose an in clinic procedure. Um, you know, like if your home is not a safe place for you to terminate, or if you are unhoused, like going to a clinic to have a procedure might be the best, safest option. Um, you know, and as Lindsay Comey, the Women's Choice Clinic Director once said to me, like surgical abortion remains the bottom line, right? If there's any retained tissue or even just like painful blood clots that a person cannot tolerate passing, then vacuum aspiration is used to complete the abortion. Um if someone has an incomplete abortion with pills, which occasionally happens, then they would need to go to the clinic for a procedure to complete that abortion. Um, and of course, later abortion care requires an in-clinic procedure. You cannot take abortion pills at home and have a later abortion at home. Um, so, you know, which is all just to say that we do need to keep fighting to keep clinics open, right? So that people can continue to have obtain safe suction abortions and other in-clinic abortion procedures. Um, okay, so I've just said a lot and I'm gonna pause there. Let me know if you want me, if you have any follow up questions. <clears throat> I guess um, extraction. Well, one one follow up thing, just based on 
so I, I completely agree. Uh, we have to think about abortion access as like an ecosystem with many different parts that include pills, clinics, primarily independent clinics, um, shout out to independent abortion providers. There may or may not be some in the audience here with us. Um, abortion funds and practical support organizations, um, activists sharing information about pills and uh, resources like the uh, miscarriage and abortion hotline, um, like if, when, how, and the repro legal helpline. Um, there is this like constellation of uh, of grassroots organizations and um, uh, uh, pieces that we need, like in this new infrastructure of care. Um, I would sort of trouble one of the last things that you said, which I think is more a matter of semantics, but um, it depends on sort of your definition of uh, later abortion care. I think whether or not a person can use pills later in pregnancy, um, abortion pills are used all over the world. Um, well into the second and even third trimester, and it's certainly not an ideal situation. However, it is safe and it is effective, and there are people that are able to hold that work. Um, and so, I, you know, I, I totally think that it's like a matter of of language, but um, and that and that again, that that is not something that's like to be taken. It's not. It's not in the same universe as taking um, pills early in pregnancy primarily, and, and it's something that entails a significantly larger amount of legal risk for the person using the pills. And that is um, primarily because of fetal tissue disposal and the fact that fetal tissue disposal is uh, used to criminalize people. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, people who are prosecuted are going to always be disproportionately women of color, poor women. And so we have to like hold that every time, oops, the, the cat cat food robot's going off because it's five o'clock. Um, so anyway, that's just one sort of like uh, caveat that I wanted to offer to what you just said. Um, but I think that- Yeah, totally. Uh, it, that's, abs that's absolutely correct. Thank you for, thank you for saying that you could absolutely use abortion pills to end a pregnancy um, and have a later abortion. Um, it's not ideal, right? But right, yes, yeah, it is possible. Yeah, it's, it, um, yeah, and it's it's just like a totally different thing than using pills earlier in pregnancy. Yeah. I do want to return yeah. to like one. So I, I love the way that you talk about this concept of liminality um, in pregnancy and MVA, and like, am I having an abortion? Am I bringing back my period? Um, mm -hmm. And like the fact that these things are entirely culturally conditioned and like the idea that, um, you know, I don't know, it's just always been so ridiculous to me that abortion, you know, is like a debate in the United States that's people arguing over like, that's a nothing clump of cells versus like that embryo is a baby. And to me, the only definition that is relevant is the one of the pregnant person and it's entirely subjective. Um, I think that it's a really interesting thing to think about um, like this concept of someone having an MVA or for that matter, using abortion pills to bring back their period like without knowledge of whether or not they're pregnant and perhaps they're indifferent to that information. Um, I think that this indifference is a really interesting potential loophole for providers in a in a landscape where abortion is criminalized. It's also sort of a, I feel like loophole is like a weird and negative word, but I think that like there is this framing of missed period pills that um, organizations like IPASS and other U.S. Uh, based um, Plan C is working on a project, is contributing to a project that like sort of focuses on this framing of like, you can use mifepristone and misoprostol to bring back your period and you don't have to know whether you are pregnant. Um, and to me, like that is sort of an emotional loophole potentially for someone who might really know that they don't want to be pregnant and they're also not comfortable saying, I want an abortion. Um, and 
I think that it's a really interesting thing to think about the potentiality of uh, of this like liminal space and how it may mm -hmm. allow for sort of like creativity and protection and ultimately people um, getting the reproductive outcomes that they want. But how do we like emphasize those sort of philosophical framings without entrenching stigma or catering to it? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's such a it's such a brilliant question. Like, thank you for just articulating it in exactly the way that you did. I mean, I think it's it's it it's not even it's it's just it is a question that like is just one that we will continue to have to think about, right? Um, you know, the earliest self helpers were so fascinated by that liminal space, right? And and talked about liminality. And I, I quote. Um, a, an early self-helper named Laura Brown, who was a major player in the movement, um, kind of represented in the book, who ended up kind of taking a turn and going on to become like a feminist philosopher who wrote a dissertation about menstrual extraction and was very fascinated by the liminality and sort of the creative generative space um, that gets opened up um, when you sort of decenter pregnancy and the sort of pregnant, non-pregnant binary. Um, you know, those early self-helpers again felt that that binaristic understanding of a female bodied person like as pregnant or not pregnant was a really patriarchal way right of thinking about the body of thinking about the female body and um you know like decentering pregnancy um not even talking about pregnancy right um was a way of just uh, repudiating that patriarchal paradigm. Um, that's my sense, right. Of kind of one way that earlier self-helpers were thinking, um, as time went on the practice and process of menstrual extraction within the sort of self-help group context, um, did become, you know, more focused on like the sort of practicality of being able to perform MVA, especially in a time when people really thought, I mean, they were, they were, See, they saw the writing on the wall. They could see that like, you know, row was going down. Right. And so um, they felt that it was like a revolutionary duty, you know, to be prepared, to be able to like provide MV MVA. And this was before abortion with pills was legal um, in the United States. And so um, pills were not an option um, in the 1980s and 1990s. Um like at least in terms of FDA approved pills, right? Um, and so I think, um, you know, like going to that loophole that you mentioned, um, exploiting the loophole, the liminal space, the kind of smokiness or grayness around pregnancy um, was a way of undermining that patriarchal, frame for thinking about the body. And um, I think like maybe for self-helpers, especially some of those early self-helpers, some might say that like, we won't be able to do away with abortion stigma until we can reimagine the body and its cycles like on our own terms. Right. Um, and so, you know, maybe we risk stigmatizing pregnancy, but we have to sort of abolish those dominant ways of thinking about pregnancy in the first place before we can sort of move our thinking beyond, right? Um, I don't know if that makes sense, but that that's kind of my sense of it is that, you know, um, for self-helpers um, who were really thinking about kind of the philosophical, theoretical significance of menstrual extraction, not to mention practical applications like, um, you know, there was this like fundamental paradigm shift that had to happen um, before abortion could be destigmatized um, and normalized. Yeah, that's what I would Absolutely. say. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't I, know. Do you, do you want to say anything? Like, I mean, what do you think? Do you want to say anything more or? Um, I think that I like everything that you've said. I think that, um, I think that framing, I think that it's all super contextual. You know what I mean? Like 
I think that um, if, I think that there is a ton of public education to be done about our bodies and um, the things that we can do to have the reproductive outcomes that we want and mm -hmm. um, the ways that we can do those things with or without doctors. And um, I think that like, there's not like one branding campaign that's going to sort of like solve this. It all feels like a really, like all of those framings feel very contextual. You know what I mean? Like, um, yeah. I don't know if that makes sense. I, I had a question. This is like a very specific uh, question about you you talk because I, I would I would love for this uh, conversation to feel like it's in, informative to to activists um, who are thinking about like building affinity groups essentially that are doing work on abortion access whether they are um, you know going out and fucking with their local crisis pregnancy center or they are sharing information about abortion pills or they're learning menstrual extraction, um, you talk about like these groups and that there's this like very specific magic number of like six to 10 people in these affinity groups. And I wonder if you could just kind of like talk about where that number seems to come from, because it very mm -hmm. much makes a lot of sense to me. And um, uh, SYA is looking at, um, you know, we're, we're developing a national organizing program that's uh, hoping to be sort of a resourcing system that supports self-organized groups all over the country who are working in a range of ways in their communities on uh, furthering abortion access. And um, I think that if folks are, for example, um, you know, doing something like MVA or if they're doing um, mutual aid around abortion pills, that, that's, the, that's the number. I don't think that, um, I, I think that that we have to, uh, I think that the survival of the next period of time has everything to do with relationships and doing work with people that you trust and um, like being cognizant of the, um, really inevitability of infiltration, whether that's by feds or antis. And um, it really makes a lot of sense that if you're doing work that's particularly subversive or vulnerable to criminalization, that you're working with a handful of people who you know well and like can move quickly. So I wondered if you could just talk about like that small group kind of orientation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So thank you so much for talking a little bit about um, just contextualizing your question. It's really interesting to hear you to hear you talk about um, how you're thinking about small group work and small affinity group work in your in your organizing right now. Um, there's so much in this book that I mean, in a lot of ways, the book, like the wager of the book is that, you know, there's something really politically powerful about small group work. Right. Um, and I, I really get into it. Um, I am someone who really holds up the small group um, and what can sort of happen between two people or three people or four people or five people um, in terms of unsettling entrenched power dynamics and, um, you know, sort of charting new uh, courses for intimacy and relationship. And anyway, so, so many things to say about, about small affinity group work. Um, you know, it, it, you're referring to how, um, in terms of the history of gynecological and abortion self-help, self-help groups uh, often included anywhere from like six to 10 people, right? That those were sort of common numbers of people that would participate in such group in, in groups such as these. Um, and I'll just, I'll mention a, a wonderful writer called Michelle Murphy, who wrote a book called Seizing the Means of Reproduction that is in part about menstrual extraction. And um, it was one of the books that I read first when I was doing, started doing research for this book. And it's, her research is just so interesting, right? Um, so I just encourage you to, to look up Michelle Murphy. But um, she actually uh, develops a critique of 
small group protocolism as she sees it unfolding in the context of abortion self-help. And she wants to locate the ways in which the logic of small group work and the sort of protocols that it comes to entail with regard to self-help is like mm, reflective of an emerging kind of neoliberal uh, subjectivity and worldview. So um, she basically argues that self-help, you know, arguably was a kind of early expression of neoliberalism, right? Um, because gynecological self-help as a political movement was unfolding kind of against the backdrop of, of an emerging neoliberalism. Um, and she described small group self-help practices as protocol feminism, right? Sort of scripted ways of talking and sharing information and doing procedures. Um, and she argues that like this protocol feminism would then be taken up in institutionalized forms um, and, you know, used by like NGOs. Um, and so, you know, and she's kind of like contextualizing this by looking at human relations research in the 1970s that was all about the small group um, and how these researchers in the 1970s felt that small groups were like special technologies for facilitating liberal self-actualization, um, which he, with Mitch, which Michelle Murphy argues is like, you know, a form of governmentality that would come to kind of define the neoliberal era. So, um, you know, she's an interesting person to look to for a critique of the small group as a sort of political technology, right? Um, she makes the sort of always already argument, right? Like it was always already in sort of incipient form of neoliberalism. Um, but, you know, I don't read gynecological and abortion self-help in that way. Um, you know, I feel like in the book, I'm I'm really kind of optimistic about it. Um, I can't like speak to all this sort of research that's been done about small group work as a kind of technology, because like, that's just not my field. But when I was researching self-help, like what people told me, what activists who were in self-help groups told me was that, you know, the reason the group had, you know, five, six, seven, eight people in it was because that's the number of roles that there were, right? Like there would be someone in the group whose job it was to hold the flashlight um, during the procedure um, and sort of uh, keep an eye on everything and make sure that nobody was breaking sterility. And then there would be somebody whose job it was to cannulate, right? Um to kind of do the actual suction, right? And then there would be somebody who was sort of passing instruments. And then there would be like a couple people who would be the support people who would be, um, you know, massaging or just providing supportive touch or words um, to the person who was receiving the procedure, right? So um, the number just sort of grew organically out of the need for a certain number of people to fulfill a certain number of roles, right? And then again, like everyone would cycle through all the roles and learn how to do all of the jobs um, so that anyone could step into any role at any time, um, which was pretty powerful to think about um, as like an opportunity of that type of work, right? Um, it's not so many people or not so many roles that not everyone can learn all of the roles, right? Um, and, you know, the groups also were, um, they were pretty fluid. Like that's another thing that people really expressed to me in the context of our interviews, right? Was that like sometimes, you know, maybe you'd be practicing over here with this group and then maybe for a little while you were practicing with this group or maybe the group had these people and then it got bigger or it got smaller, right? Um, there were ways in which the groups were sort of like these super secure cells and people really kind of kept to their own group and like intentionally didn't um, know a lot about like what other groups were doing, right? And that was like a security measure. But at the same time, there was, there was fluidity and movement, right? So the numbers weren't, they weren't like set, right? Um, some people I interviewed said that absolutely six people needed to be at a procedure for a menstrual extraction that was a pregnant menstrual extraction. Some people shared that, you know, no, it was like three or four people, right? So um, there was so much variation just in terms of, of people's own accounts and sort of logics of, of why things were done the way they were done, right? But everything was done for a reason in the way that it was done. Um, that was a sentiment that um, self-helpers expressed to me. Um they were very methodical. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but. Yes, totally. I love, yeah. I love that answer. And um, I would love if you 
could drop the that person's name uh, in the chat. The the author of, of the critique of the critique of neoliberal um, affinity groups. I want to um, or yeah, I will do whatever, it. Whatever you just it. said in a really smart way. Um, I want to uh, be mindful of time and also look at a oh. couple of the questions um, in the chat. And if folks are watching and have questions for Angela, please um, continue to put them in the chat. I, I think that um, Lynn's question is definitely like I, I have I have a lot more things that we didn't get to, but um, uh, I wanted to talk about the sperm bank. I wanted to talk about the Black Panthers. Maybe we can still do those things, but I want to just sort of um, ask a, a bookendy type question if folks are on the verge of needing to, to sign off. Um, and that is, what as aspects of the history that you researched do you feel are most important for us to know both about and how to do in where we find ourselves today? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That, yes. I mean, there are so many kernels of insight and important takeaways from this history. Like it's hard to just sort of settle on one. Um, one self-helper who I interviewed fairly extensively for the book, he went, goes by the pseudonym of Max. And I remember, um, you know, Max really emphasized to me in our conversations, like, you know, if there's anything that I want the readers of your book to know, it's that like, you can do this wherever you are, right? Like you can do this wherever you are. Um, and what the, this is, is, you know, I think, you know, in the context of that, of that particular comment, I believe Max was talking specifically about menstrual extraction, right? Manual vacuum aspiration is something that really, um, anyone can learn. Um, but I think that, you know, the, this is, is also broader, right? Like, um, we could be talking uh, more broadly about doing affinity group work of, um, you know, collaborating with friends to work on a political project and to learn how to do something, you know, um, to, um, you know, sort of be accountable to the best, most recent information about abortion pill access, for example, and then making sure that you're capable of speaking knowledgeably um, to family and friends um, about that information, right? Those those sorts of things. So um, I think that would be like one of the main takeaways for me. Um, as I was kind of like trying to finish the book, I was doing a lot of like kind of combing through my notes and my interviews and like my chapter drafts and trying to kind of figure out like what were some of the main political insights um, of the movement based on people's words. And I ended up um, kind of like doing some list making and I was just kind of bringing together people's words and noting resonances and repetitions of certain sentiments and ideas. And um, I ended up writing um, a poem. I'm, I'm a poet. And so um, I'm, I'm inclined to do that sort of thing. And um, I ended up like sort of taking quotes or slightly adapted versions of quotes from activists and collaging them into a poem um, that like brings together lessons of self-helpers and clinic defenders. And it's not a very long poem, so maybe I could just read it. I'll just take a minute. Um, and I think that some of the words in the poem actually might like answer Lynn's question. Um, it's at the very end of the book, the, the section or the poem, I guess, is titled Self-Help is Where the Power Is. There are many more lessons from self-helpers and clinic defenders. The personal is political and silence equals death. So use all the tools of your being. Ask questions. Be in your body. Know what your body is. Claim the liminal space. You have the right to bleed. Feel your agency and recognize your power. Your life has meaning and you get to determine what that is. Take responsibility for your life. Choose yourself inside of your life. Slow down, have a different vibe, hold intensity, listen. Be anti-hierarchical and interested in process. Be in it for the long haul. Find your action pack and roam the world with healing intent. Get your hands into things you normally wouldn't. Learning how to put your hands inside of somebody is a good thing to learn how to do. Learn the steps. Anybody can learn them. Learn how to do all the jobs. Learn how to produce what you need. Become proficient in what will help you help each other. 
There's no way to learn except to do. Allow the best part of you to be present in whatever role you are in. Allow everyone to become a teacher. No one person is the expert. Use the collective intelligence of the group. Look in with curiosity, warmth, and engagement. Have a sense of humor. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know how it's going to unfold, but you're here. So be ready to be really, really open. Support each other's mutual growth. Take care of each other. Everyone deserves a place. So make yours a household. Do not leave anyone behind. Define your work for yourself. Be part of carrying on traditions of resistance. Bring your razor sharp analysis, redistribute knowledge, build in the mechanism and trust rhythm. Don't say anything you aren't willing to eat. If they make the law, break the law. Rage is your bitter fuel. Learn what it means to defend other people. Remember that you can learn how to do this wherever you are. Be grateful for the lessons. Thank you so much for reading that. I'm so glad that you did. Um, I was, I downloaded the audio version of this book. And um, in addition, I read most of it in the paperback, but then I was running around traveling and I wanted to like have an audio version as well. And I was like, I was in DC this weekend and I was flying home just like exhausted by being in, you know, the creepiest city that this creepy ass country has. And um, this poem was like, <laughs> I was like falling asleep in the middle seat between like two big, like farting men. And the <laughs> poem was like being read to me while I was like kind of sleeping, but then like jerking to awakeness. And it was like mm -hmm. a really nice um, meditative, like, yeah, it was, it was a really positive part of my flight experience. <laughs> Um, so thank you for, for reading that in a much more pleasant environment now that I'm in the comfort of my own home. Um, yeah, thanks to, thanks to Lynn for the question. It just felt like such an invitation to kind of turn to that poem and just you yeah. know, leave you with some words. Yes. And your, um, you know, you, your work is so generous. Um, I know that you have said that, like, it was an incredible honor for you to, create it and um I it, it really comes through and I feel like your uh that poem outro being like uh you know these kernels of of like knowledge that you have absorbed from these incredible people that you got to spend so much time with is um really a statement of like the generosity of your work and um yeah. So thank you. Um, I, I want to ask another question that Bob put in the chat. Bob put three great questions in the chat and I want to get to these and then we can kind of maybe wind down. But yeah. um, Bob's first question is, did you research, did your research turn up any out queers in raw? And if so, what type of actions were they involved in? Mm. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I, yeah, like there were queers everywhere, right? Um, <laughs> and um, I guess I feel like, you know, sort of the story that I tell about Raw, and actually that section about Raw that I read, I co-wrote that with Raven, who's the person who I was sort of primarily citing in that section, which was really cool to be able to do that, you know, to sort of collaborate on a little section from the book and I include like a note about it. Um, and I, I think like what I say about Raw in the book is kind of like what I, is sort of what I'm reporting on, what I'm sharing, like with with the participation and consent of raw. And I think like, you know, I, I'm so excited for the activists who were raw and who've gone on to do other amazing work in the world. Um, I'm so excited for them to like tell more of their own story, right? Like on their own terms and in their own, in their own words and voices. And I'll like, leave it, I'll leave it to them to do that, you know? And like, you just get this little, this little bit about Roots Against War, this kind of amazing autonomous uh, group of, you know, radical young people of color activists who just were so able to make all of these connections um, between all of these different political struggles, you know? Um, so yeah, we will we will read more about raw. I don't I don't doubt it, but I'll I'll leave it to them to tell their stories. We we didn't get a chance to um touch on this, but if we're gonna talk about like young radicals uh in, in the Bay Area, 
young people of color. Um, the Black Panther connection that you make in the book is incredible and um, it's not, it, it deserves more time than we have to be paraphrased, but um, the Panthers were about self-help as well in a different way in order to avoid, to avoid um, encountering medical racism and to be self-sufficient um, as a culture and like not rely on fucked up white people to take care of them uh, in a way that was not actually care at all often. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that um, you draw those parallels beautifully and there is like a lot of movement contextualizing that's really well done in the beginning of the book that I also feel like is um, really critical like activist context uh, that I will definitely not attempt to paraphrase, but like the movements for eugenics and population control and birth control um, and then, you know, black nationalist, often pro-natal movements and the way that all of these things were setting the stage for uh, the emergence of groups like you talk about. And of course, for later, the emergence of the framework of reproductive justice um, coined by a group of 12 black women who were looking at all of this shit and saying, and the, of course, mainstream white led uh, pro-choice movement and saying, this is not speaking, none of this is speaking to the concerns of our communities and our families and our bodies and lives. Um, and I think that it's it's important to hold that articulation uh, of reproductive justice, of people having the right to have families, not have families, create their families in the ways that they want and raise their families in safe communities. Um, that that is like the most clear articulation of all of the things that we need to be fighting for. Um, and yeah, I just, I think that uh, you really beautifully and succinctly do a lot of contextualizing of sort of like the overlapping efforts of all of those movements to essentially like control or harness uh, reproduction on behalf of state powers, essentially. Um, mm -hmm. I want to ask Bob's last question, which is has to do with trans men. And Bob asks, did you learn of any clinic defense or reproductive justice groups that either acknowledged or involved any trans men who might personally face issues of pregnancy regulation in that time? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, you know, queer, queer gender non-conforming trans folks were and are everywhere, right? I mean, I think, you know, we've seen a tremendous amount of progress in terms of trans, trans visibility and trans liberation in, you know, the last decade and a half, especially. Um, you know, it's interesting, like as a historian, um, one thing that I really wrestled with was like, you know, how, you know, what do you do about language, right? Like, um, in the 1980s or early 1990s, like it was just not as common for someone to be like uh, transgender identified or trans identified, right? Um, there were lots of trans people and lots of people who were out as trans people, but you know, also a lot of folks who were just like, you know, doing work on the term queer or identifying as gender non-conforming or you know, like using other words to talk about what now we might have a vocabulary for um, that you know is sort of within um, trans liberation and, um, transness. And I think like one thing that I learned was that, um, you know, like trans people worked at women's choice, right? Trans people were abortion workers and abortion providers and people who identified as gender non-conforming, you know, worked, worked at women's choice and were involved in clinic defense. And, um, you know, actually there's a, person in my book whose pseudonym is Danny Rose, who's, uh, identifies as non-binary and, um, they were involved in raw and talk a little bit about their experience obtaining an abortion and also being, um, a black non-binary person doing this really intense sort of frontline clinic defense work. Um, and there's a lot of information in the stories that they share, I think, you know, just in terms of understanding the intersection of, of those identities and experiences at that moment in time. And, um, yeah, you know, people kind of people who I talk to are sort of like all over the gender spectrum, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think um, sure. you know, a lot of people, a lot of people involved in self-help, especially in gynecological and abortion self-help, were um, you know, they were women, like they identified as women, right? But maybe mm -hmm. like when I interviewed them, I was like, you know, you don't look like 
I wouldn't assume <laughs> that you were, I mean, I don't assume that anybody is anything, you know, yeah. <laughs> we just, right. that's where we're at. Right. Like we just, we were learning how to not do that. And, yeah. um, but yeah, I mean, people, I think one thing that sort of delighted me and impressed me and surprised me and also just seemed real, you know, is that people involved in abortion defense, self-help, you know, clinic work, clinic defense, were like all over the gender spectrum, right? And how they describe themselves and their gender then in some cases is different from how they do today, right? Um, and in some, you know, yeah, like it's just that sort of much, that complicated thing of history, right? And how our language changes as our, um, you know, just as our sort of worlds change. But yeah, these are these are awesome questions. Thank you so much, Bob. Yeah, I think you do a really beautiful job with language in the book. Um, and it's like your book is just a shining example of how you can speak about reproductive health care in an inclusive way that doesn't, you know, leave anybody out and marginalize anybody and contribute to like trans erasure and trauma around reproductive health care for trans people. And you can also use the word women. Like like it's such a straw man argument. Like when people are like, stop asking me to not say the word women. No one's doing that. We're going to say all the things. Just don't generalize in a way that like says shit that's not true. You know what I mean? Sure. Um, yeah, for sure. Totally. Yeah. And I, yeah. I, I think you, you do a beautiful job and I'm sure that it felt like a really like scary needle to thread because like the last thing you want to do is hurt people and um, uh, writing books is really scary. And I, I had the same when SYA made our book, we very much um, have the same like struggle with how to approach gendered language. And we ultimately like let people talk about themselves how they want to, which is the whole fucking deal, yeah. right? Like it's not that yeah. hard actually. Um, yeah. I want to end this on time and I want to thank Bob for in the chat also, again, calling attention to the reproductive justice catastrophe that is uh, occurring in Gaza. And, um, and you know, we are all holding that. And um, I, I think it just is important to name that it's happening and that we're not fucking okay with it. Um, there are events, there are uh, protests happening all over the country on Saturday. Um, and you can find information about those collective gatherings um, uh, through Palestinian uh, Youth Liberation on Instagram. Um, so thank you everybody so much for being here. And um, thank you Liberty for having us and thank you Firestorm. And thank you Angela for your beautiful book that is a gift to activists everywhere. And um, it's just been a, truly a pleasure. It's been amazing. Thank you so much for your brilliant questions and facilitation, Amelia. And thank you, Liberty and Firestorm and like everyone in the room for showing up and to those who brought questions. Just, I appreciate you all so much. Thank you. It's been amazing. Thank you. All. This has been a huge pleasure. I just want to encourage people to pick up this book. It's There's so much more in this book than we could possibly get to tonight. Um, you can get a copy from us. You can get a copy from the publisher, AK Press, who we love and adore, support them. Um, but yes, yeah. thanks. Uh, thanks again to y'all for coming out tonight. This has been just absolutely wonderful. And I hope that y'all get to continue the conversation in a forum that's accessible to all of us, because I know there's so much more to say. Thanks, everybody. Everybody. Bye.